One model that people frequently use in longitudinal studies is a longitudinal confirmatory factor model like this one here. So here we have multiple indicators, in this case three, that were measured on two time points. Of course, you could have more indicators and or more time points, but this is just to show you a generic longitudinal CFA model. And so one issue that we frequently face when we have a multiple indicator design and a longitudinal study is that a model like this often doesn't fit. And so the reason for this is, or one reason can be that there are indicator specific effects or method effects, meaning the same indicators are more highly correlated with themselves across time. And that's frequently the case because we use, for example, questionnaire data in the social sciences where the different indicators might be different items, they might show different item wording, they might cover different content or slightly different facets of a construct that we want to measure. And therefore, we often see this inhomogeneity in the um, covariance structure or correlation structure such that the same item shares more variance with itself across time, meaning has a higher covariance or a higher correlation with itself across time than with the other indicators. Now, this model here implies that there's unidimensionality of the indicators at a given time point. And so the only way that the indicators can be, or that the associations of the indicators across time are explained in this model is via their loadings on the latent factors, tau one and tau two, and then the covariance of the factors across time. Now, if the indicators are differentially related across time, meaning if some indicators correlate more highly with themselves, let's say maybe 0.7, um, then they correlate with the other indicators, let's say 0.6, then this model does not account for those differences in the covariances or correlations across time. And so what people then frequently do in longitudinal models is that they allow the error variables for a given variable to be correlated across time. So in this case here, we would allow the error terms for the first variable to be correlated. So that would be epsilon one, one with epsilon one, two. And then we would also correlate epsilon two, one with epsilon two, two. And we would correlate epsilon three, one with epsilon three, two. And so that takes care of the issue of item specific effects or method effects, because then these residual associations of these items that are not captured by the correlation here between the states, as unidimensional factors, those residual associations are then captured by those correlated errors. Now, in this video, I want to actually show you that this is something that I recommend that you not do and that you shouldn't do in longitudinal studies. And I also want to explain why I think that this is a bad method to represent these residual associations. So, why is this? What are arguments against this, against doing this? First of all, when you have error terms in confirmatory factor analysis models that are correlated, then that indicates that you have systematic sources of variability, meaning sources of variability that are not random error, that are not accounted for the model. And so from a psychometric perspective, from a measurement oriented perspective, we don't like that so much because it means that there's something reliable in our variables that we are omitting from the factor structure. So those reliable sources of variance are not represented by a true score factor or a component of the true score variance. And so then that true score variance gets confounded with measurement error. And that has the consequence that then we would be underestimating the reliability coefficients for our measurements. And that's often sometimes something that we're interested in when we estimate models of longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis or other CFA models. We want to find out how reliable are the measures and we want to get a good estimate, a good model-based reliability estimation. Now, in this case, if there are correlated errors, then we will be underestimating the reliabilities of the indicators and there's no way to disentangle what is measurement error here and what is systematic variable specific effect. So that's one downside is that you would be confounding the systematic source of variance with error. You would be underestimating the reliabilities of your measures. 
what are other downsides of this approach? Another downside is that this is not very parsimonious if you have many indicators and many time points, because then you would have to estimate many, many of these error correlation parameters, which leads to a very highly parameterized model. And also, in that situation, oftentimes you will find that many of these error correlations are actually not statistically significant. They are near zero, they may not be significant, and then what do you do with them? So how do you interpret that? Because if you keep them in the model, then you have parameters in the model that are not needed. So you have an overly parameterized model with effects that are zero. If you drop them from the model, then the interpretation of your state factors changes because then some indicators do not have specific variance and some indicators or the specific variance for some indicators then becomes part of those state factors, the tau one and tau two factors, and that can cause interpretation difficulties because then you don't have the same, so say symmetry in the model. And this is something then that, that is purely data driven and it can also be arbitrary or a little bit um, depending, not arbitrary, but it can depend on chance a little bit, which correlations are significant and which ones are not. Um, and there can be something like type one error inflation when you have many, when you test many of these correlations um, and stuff like that. So you have many, many additional parameters in the model and that can cause problems for the interpretation when some of them aren't significant. Now, how can you solve this issue? What, are, what is a more parsimonious way that avoids some of these issues that I mentioned with the correlated errors or correlated residuals? I want to show you one approach here. There are other approaches for longitudinal data where um, they also, although that also address this issue, but I want to show you one approach that I have found useful in my own work. So instead of putting correlated errors into the model, you can choose an approach where you pick one of the indicators as reference and you introduce method factors or indicator specific factors for the remaining indicators to contrast those indicators against the reference indicator. This approach was first um, introduced by Michael Eid in the context of latent state trade models and the reference is included here in the description for this video in case you want to check this out more. So the idea is you pick a reference variable. In this case, that would be the first variable, Y1T. And you can see that now the latent factors also have an index for the variable because they are now specific to this indicator, this marker indicator. And so this could, for example, be a variable, an item that has been shown in previous analyses to be a marker indicator, some item that or variable that loads especially highly on the construct or uh, an item that from a substantive perspective is a very good marker um, that captures the content of the construct very well. So that indicator you would choose or in case you don't know which one is particularly special or a marker indicator, you could just arbitrarily pick an indicator if you think that they, the indicators are essentially measuring the same um, construct. And so then in addition, you add a method factor for the second and for the third variable and that method factor, those method factors capture the residual associations across time. So they capture stable residual variance in those non-reference indicators that are not explained by this association of the reference latent variables here and their association. So basically those method factors do the same thing as what the error covariances do. However, they do, they, they do that in a more parsimonious way as I will show in a few moments. So for these method factors, well, these method factors are defined as residual factors, meaning they represent variance in those non-reference indicators that is stable across time, but that is not shared with a reference indicator. Therefore, these method factors are not correlated with the state factors. So when we specify this model in programs like, for example, M plus, we have to indicate that M2 and M3 are not allowed to correlate with those latent state factors, tau1 and tau2. The loadings on the method factors can all be 
fixed to one because it's the same variable across time and there's not really a reason why that loading should change. However, this is not a requirement. The loadings, some of the loadings can be freely estimated, but it's often not necessary. In addition, we can estimate the correlation between the method factors in case those non-reference methods share or those non-reference indicators share variance with one another above and beyond what they share with the reference variable. So for example, if you have one positively worded item that serves as the marker, that for example um, is an item that says I am happy and you have two other items where one item says I am unhappy and the other item says I am dissatisfied, then maybe those negatively worded items would share specific variants with one another above and beyond what they share with the happy marker indicator. And so that would then be indicated by this correlation of those method factors. Now, this model is more parsimonious than the error covariance model when you have more uh, time points and more variables because regardless of the number of time points, you would uh, only estimate a variance for each of those method factors. So for each method factor, for each indicator, you have a variance to estimate for each factor. And then you estimate the covariances of these factors if necessary. But with correlated errors and more time points, you would have a lot more parameters because for each additional time point, you have more of those correlated errors. But here, as long as you don't estimate the loadings freely on the method factors, there will be no additional parameters um, for more time points. There will only be additional parameters for more indicators because for each additional indicator, you will have to add uh, factor variance and then also the covariances of this factor with the other factor. So in general, uh, on, under many conditions, this model leads to a more parsimonious representation of the data than a model with correlated errors. And also here you have a clear separation of the variance components because the systematic but indicator specific variance is now not confounded with measurement error for the non-reference indicators, but rather that specific variance is now represented by those method factors here. And so they explain that component of variance. As a result, you will not underestimate the reliabilities of the measures as I will show you on the next slide. Each source of variance is represented in the model by a latent factor and there is not a source of variance that is confounded with measurement error. So here you can see the variance decomposition based on this model since the conventional state factors tau and the method residual factors m are uncorrelated. We have an additive decomposition of the observed variance. So the variance of each measure in this model can be broken down into variance that is um, due to the reference state factor plus method variance or indicator specific variance that is unique to a non-reference indicator not shared with a reference indicator and then measurement error. And so previously in the model with correlated errors, these two sources of variance here, the last two would be confounded, but here they're not confounded. They can be separated. And so therefore we can now also look at these different sources of variance separately and quantify them, with it, which is also an advantage of this approach over an approach with correlated errors because we can learn a lot more about our measurements now with this approach. We can define a so-called convergent validity coefficient. We also sometimes call that a consistency coefficient because that coefficient indicates the consistency between the reference indicator and the non-reference indicators. And so for the non-reference indicators, this can be computed as the variance component that these indicators have in common with the reference indicator. And that's given by the um, reference state loading lambda squared times the variance of tau divided by the observed or model implied observed variance. And you can also easily calculate that just simply based on the squared standardized loading of a non-reference measure on the reference state 
factor. So for example, if you find that convergent validity is 0.6, then it means that 60% of the variance in that non-reference measure would be accounted for by the reference state variable, or we could say shared with the reference indicator. And then we can also determine the variance component that is due to the method factor. So that would be called method specificity, or you could call it indicator specificity. That is given by the ratio of the method factor variance over the model implied observed variance, or you can easily calculate it based on the standardized method factor loading squared. And so, for example, it might be you might find that method specificity maybe is point. Uh, two, then that would mean 20% of the variance in that indicator is specific variance, is not shared with the reference indicator. So we have 20% indicator specificity. And you could also interpret that as unique trait variance in the sense of latent state trait theory, because this method factor is kind of like a residual trait. It captures stable variance across time or covariances across time. And so it can be interpreted as like a unique um, trait effect, so to say. Those two coefficients, convergent validity and method specificity, add up to the reliability coefficient. So for example, if we found convergent validity was 0.6 and method specificity was 0.2, then the reliability of that variable would be 0.8, or 80% of the variance is systematic variance. And that shows you an advantage, again, of this model over the model with correlated errors, because now this previously uh, this variance component that previously was confounded with measurement error is now here represented as a systematic source of variance. It's represented by this method specificity coefficient ms, and so therefore we will not be underestimating our reliability coefficient for a measure because this source of variance is now here uh, rep is represented here. And so we can use the sum of convergent validity and method specificity to determine reliability and reliability then will be more appropriately estimated than in a model with correlated errors. This reliability coefficient that is given by this model with residual method factors is equal to the R squared that many programs for confirmatory factor analysis give as the R squared for observed variables. For example, in M plus, you get an R squared for the observed variables as part of the standardized solution, and that would be exactly identical to the sum of convergent validity plus method specificity for a given variable. So this shows you a more sophisticated yet also more simple way in some ways to account for indicator specific effects in longitudinal studies. This model in under most conditions is more parsimonious than a solution with correlated errors. It's also more interpretable and causes less problems of interpretation then the model with correlated errors, it gives you more information because you can separate these variance components, you can study how homogeneous your indicators are, you can quantify that homogeneity with these coefficients, so you can find out uh, is there a lot of specificity in these measures or is there um, high convergent validity of these measures, and so this model provides you with a lot more information and um, also, it often fits the data very well while having more degrees of freedom in many cases than a model with correlated errors. I hope you found this video useful and maybe you can apply this model to your own longitudinal data. If you do, let me know in the comments how that worked out. Also, if you have comments or um, Another opinion on this matter, please let me know in the comments. This is a pretty controversial topic, so I'm curious to hear about your thoughts. Also check out the description for additional videos and workshops, and please subscribe to this channel if you like these types of videos, and I'll see you next time.